You are listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lintonmeyer. My guest for episode 102 is John Andrew Frederick, leader of the Los Angeles-based band The Black Watch. They put out 17 albums and five EPs since 1988. You are right now hearing Terrific from their second full album, 1991's Flowering. We're going to be talking today about Eustacia's Dream from his latest Magic Johnson, 2019, then Emily Are You Sleeping from the 2011 album Led Zeppelin V, then Inner City Garden from 2005's The Hypnotizing Sea, and finally we're going to hear a brand new unreleased track called Much of a Muchness. John is also an English professor. He's put out four comic novels, including some that are semi-autobiographical about the band. He paints a very interesting guy. Check out johnandrewfrederick.com. For more about this podcast, check out nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. I will have played a little bit of Terrific, your big single from Flowering 1991, your second full album, A Long Journey. Now we're going to talk about uh, Magic Johnson. So this is your 17th album with five EPs on top of that, I think, since 1988. Do you want to say a little about that journey before we actually hear the Magic Johnson track? I could say a little about it, but that wouldn't be the same as me saying too much about it, which I could go on forever and ever. I don't, this is the first time I've ever been rendered speechless. I don't know what to say about 31 years worth of indie music output. And it finds a parallel, I think, sometimes when people first discover the band and go, oh my gosh, where do I start? I don't know which record to get. My bandmate Andy Creighton the other day asked me, you know, he hasn't been in the band for the entirety of the 30 years, just the last four or five. You know, he said, you know, where would you recommend that somebody began? And I thought, gosh, I can't do that to myself or, you know, in some ways to the records. You know, it's so hard to, to be objective. Bands always think that the latest thing that they've done is their best thing. They're deeply prejudiced in that, in favor of that new thing. So, a long-winded way of telling you i have no idea what to say i don't know you're the one who's done a lot of research of late to get to know the band on the hurry up like this you know you just got the new record and became apprised of our existence right i've listened to i think all the things that are on spotify and on Bandcamp at least once and some of the things that particularly caught my ear several times which in terms of the overall shape of the band you know if i'm going to give my history in, in short, you know, I, I talk about general stylistic movements and geographical movements. Well, you've been in LA the whole time. You did start out, as I read in your book, it was your band, but there was a, another lead singer. So you had the male-female harmonies and a little bit of trading off there. And then you've swapped out lead guitarists a few times over the years, right? You had a, one of the guys from The Chills in there. Is he now? Or I, I didn't... Yeah, no, no, that's Steve Scheer. He was in The Chills, and it was my dream to have him join the band. Uh-huh. We've been best friends for 20 years or so. And being in The Chills, you know, sort of killed off his interest in music. The Chills were his very favorite band. You can just imagine what it'd be like to join your very favorite band and then find out that they're a miasma of dysfunction. You know, <laughs> as, as great as they are, you know, every, we all love the chills greatly. I mean, I think Steve was greatly disillusioned by that. And then so he retired from music for something like seven or eight or nine years. And I pleaded with him once he moved back to Los Angeles from Portland to join the band. And then we began a whole different sort of drama as it were, but no, he's not in the group now. It's a guy called Andy Creighton is the other guitar player who has his own very fine band called The World Record. He's sort of guy who's incapable of writing a bad song. They're much more on the big star end of influences than we are. Just focusing on Magic Johnson then, say a few words about where we're at with this album and Eustacia's Dream in particular, and then we're going to play that in full and we'll talk about it in some detail. I seem to be compulsive and obsessive compulsive in the light of the fact that I can't seem to stop writing songs. Magic Johnson had its provenance in me going up to Santa Barbara, a really good friend of mine, Craig Costigan, who has worked in the industry in a bunch of different capacities from being an engineer and a producer. And now he works for an effects company in Nashville. And he's got some good engineering skills and an encyclopedic knowledge of indie music. And he had left his job at Seymour Duncan and he had access to a bunch of studios in my hometown. I love to go back to Santa Barbara. Craig was hurting for work and looking for a job. And I thought, gosh, you know, I've just written a few songs. Can I just come and track some guitars and vocals with you? He has lovely amps and 
Everybody's really sweet there in terms of just going, hey, Craig's got an old friend. And I know a lot of people are still musicians in Santa Barbara. Can we just use the studio? So I think we did four songs, just guitar and voice. And from there, I thought, okay, well, gosh, this is the germination of a record. It must be. So, you know, I write in sort of chunks. Two songs come and they need to be answered, as it were, by another couple. And that's how an EP might begin, where you kind of just go, I mean, in the same way that each one of our albums has been kind of a reaction against the record that's come before it. So the one that came before Magic Johnson is called Witches, and it's much more just guitar and a 808 state thumping four to the floor kind of thing. I just sort of imagined if Sid Barrett was to join New Order, you know, I thought I'd write a bunch of really weird songs with odd, always literary, because I'm a compulsive reader. If you see, look behind me, there's about 4,000 books. So and anyway, Magic Johnson's really back to a much more raucous approach to recording with some acoustic-ish kind of things in there that are more twisted, I think. And Eustacia's Dream in particular, that came from, because I'm a big Thomas Hardy fan, I haven't read all of his novels, but I came back to him after having been immersed in his stuff in graduate school. Return of the Native, Eustacia Vice has this weird dream about somebody that she fancies that turns into the lyrics that I used for the song about a young, pretty English countryside girl who fancies some guy and has a dream of him coming to him, swooping down on her, so to speak, and sweeping her away from this country dance to a pool in the woods and suddenly they're swimming together but he's kept his beaver visor on the whole time she and he goes to kiss her and she never gets to see his face and he disappears like a, a pack of cards which is sounds like hardy was influenced by you know alice in wonderland might have been i don't know maybe alice in wonderland comes after return of the native i'm not sure maybe that's an english folkloric thing of for you know a suitor would be you know wooer to just turn into a play 52 pickup with himself or whatever so i just thought it would make a really curious song for the idea of sort of like pre-ghosting it prefigures the, the modern dating thing of someone you take out a couple times and text a couple times back and you never hear from them back there's hardy's 19th century you know the english take on ghosting a friend to my surprise that I was To music that was wondrous as could be And the pull the black horse they came prancing A knight in silver armor up to me A knight in silver armor up to me World and twirl together all the evening. What would it like I could but suppose? For into the early hours of morning, the visor on his helmet remained closed. The visor on his helmet remained closed. I could see his face Oh, but I could see it now i 
lifting up his beaver He flew apart just like a pack of cards Flew apart just like a pack of cards Oh, but I can see his face Oh, but I have seen it now You had picked this out as as an example of your compulsive reading of poetry and how that feeds in, or literature more generally, how that feeds into the music. That's actually the only Thomas Hardy book that I have read, but I read it so long ago, like I did not make this connection at all. You're saying some of the actual lines even are moved, or it's just the general ideas? I don't think I lifted any particular lines from Hardy, even though he'd be in the public domain now, and I don't think that the Hardy Foundation and the imaginary district of Wessex would come after me or anything like that. But it's one of those things of like WH Auden said, you know, art begets art. So anytime I listen to something or read something or go to a museum or gallery and look at pictures, it, something's going to enter into one's consciousness. And if a really nice melody comes out of looking at a Hogarth painting or something by Francis Bacon or what have you, or going to see a play or whatever, that a song comes from that that's got a catchy melody, then I'm not going to feel as though that there's anything at all reprehensible about plundering other works of art to make what one hopes is a real live work of art. Now, this is from a female point of view. I mean, of course, lyrics are generally poetic. They're generally rhyme, but they're not as overtly, intentionally dated in the way, as wondrous as could be. What are you kind of thinking when you're you know, thinking about how you're going to phrase this? Is it just to try to make the potential awkwardness of the language just melt into the melody so it just sounds nice and you don't really focus on the fact that you're wondrous as could be, you know, like... <laughs> I think it demands something of the listener to kind of go, you know, you have to look more deeply to think, wow, this is a male voice talking about when he went to kiss me in the water as from the perspective of a woman. So it taxes uh, just a touch the listener to just go, okay, this is a curious twist. And I like doing that sort of thing. You know, it's not like I'm trying to impersonate a literary character and a woman, but in some ways to let the spirit of the words be conveyed. And there's only so much you can do with that without becoming over the top and Peter Gabriel-ish. I mean, I'm not the kind of singer who would ever affect a bunch of different kinds of voices. Sometimes in a Genesis song during the early ones that Gabriel did, or even later the solo stuff, he's a Cockney or he's a posh guy or he's a fairy, etc. So I'd be too self-conscious to go that route. We call that tone painting in terms of interpreting lyrics, right? So I think there's an element of that, but I think I have good enough engineers and producers around me who would reel me in if I, sometimes they ask me to go farther in terms of those kinds of, you know, go out there interpretations. But I don't know, I'm really torn between my love for very placid vocals, a la like what Belinda and Kevin Shields do in My Bloody Valentine, and the yelping, caterwauling element of another deep influence that I've tried to mask for years and years, which is Robert Smith of The Cure, at least as far as the vocal delivery goes, you know, amalgamation of some of that charismatic approach to singing and also, you know, cooing and ooing and aahing along the lines of that sort of approach, like much shoegaze stuff where it's divested completely of emotion. Well, speaking of tone painting, so I noticed in the arrangement, you got a really nice wall of sound on really all all three of these that we're going to listen to in terms of just how the guitars blend. I notice as the second verse comes in around 33 seconds or so, you've had a kind of a sludgy but driving rhythm guitar with a nice answering chorus licks on the right side. And I'm hearing, I think it's when you're singing, we whirled and twirled all evening. You know, there's... I wasn't sure if it was an additional guitar was coming in or the keyboard was doing something else or somebody just turned up an effect like on the existing guitar because there's like some actual whirling and twirling going on there, you know, during that verse. Again, that's very astute for you to have noticed that and that probably could be laid at the 
not feet, but the fingertips of Scott Campbell, our longtime producer, who often has the lyrics in front of him before we even start to record the song. And certainly while he's mixing, he's one of these geniuses, Scott Campbell is, like so many people I know in the record industry who are absolutely brilliant, who never went to college. Scott turned to me the other month and said, you know, John, every one of those books that you've given me, I've read. <laughs> and it's just terrific to hear something like that. So, you know, he's very attuned without having a university degree or anything to the poetry of the lyrics. And, you know, I don't consider my lyrics poetry, but they're certainly poetic. So anytime that he feels like it's appropriate and can drive the song further. And this is one of the arguments that, that what you're pointing out is one of the arguments for taking one of our records. And, you know, if you like it to try to go deeper and listen to headphones, just like the ones that you've asked me to put on to do this interview. I mean, they, I do think that we're trying to reward those kinds of listeners who feel as though music has to be a very, very intimate sort of experience between you and some headphones, you know, where you get the full gist and blast of what the artist and his cohorts, the mixing engineers and the producers are trying to do. So, you know, a lot of time, there's a lot of room, in other words, for ideas from the brilliant, lovable people that I'm so lucky to work with. It always seems a, a challenge to mix the vocals right when you have a guitar wall of sound like this, that they really drive through. Like, it's a fairly mellow song overall. You know, it's not big and noisy with a quiet recounting of a dream, but it's just got this steady drive. You know, the rhythm section is mostly eighth notes on bass. There's not a lot of particular riffs that are sticking out. The drums are blazing away. You got your sludgy rhythm guitar. And then just there are no breaks between the verses. You have the repeated line, a knight in silver armor up to me, a knight in silver armor up to me, the visor on and helmet remain closed. Repeat that line. And then it just keeps going. Unlike most of your songs, if, from what I recall, where there's often a, now let's kind of sit back and listen to the backing stuff do their thing because the vocals have stopped. Here the vocals are mellow enough and they sit in the middle enough and they have gaps already between them. You've got line, space, line, space that it can just go all the way through. Yeah, that's something that we struggle with of late because I've been trying to write more sparse things, but I'm a wordy bastard. It really is the case and you know that's my motif a lot of the time. I've got a lot to say, so it would be self-conscious for me to pare it back. One thing we have been aware of of late is not to include bridges in songs. I'm obviously a slavish devotee of the Beatles. You can hear that all through any of the records. But I used to write more bridges because the paradigm was John and Paul's approach to that. But the longer we've gone on, the fewer bridges there have been. But I think you know there, we tried with this record and a new and a record that's yet to be released or recorded as a reaction to Magic Johnson, something called Brilliant Failures that we're now trying to find a home for, that we did try to relax that hyper-lyrical, very garrulous approach to lyrics and have many more musical passages where we just kind of glide. Yeah, well, this is delightfully spare. The, the, when you get to the chorus, you know, just that, oh, I could see his face, oh, I could see it now, oh... That's it. That's the whole chorus. <laughs> and then you do have a bridge, but it's just this keyboard heavy instrumental bridge. Was any of the sequence like it sounds in that section like you've got some synth tambourine or something like there's some more articulated percussion in there? Scott doesn't like me to come to the mixing sessions. He likes to just play me finished mixes. And we've done this is, I think, the seventh or eighth record we've done. So if he adds those whirling sounds like a Wurlitzer or a, a Leslie speaker up in the upper registers, it's just something he knows that I'll like. He has the same with variations, taste in music and in sounds sonically. You know, we're very attuned to each other, pun intended. So, I mean, I wasn't there. This is not just effects. Let me just play a little of the section because there's actual percussion jumping out here. It could just be the way the drums are engineered in that section. I'm not sure. It just throughout some of the, the rest of it, you don't even hear hi hat. You're hearing kick and snare, and it could just be that there was hi hat the whole time and it was just turned down, and here it's up but affected in some way. There's a lot of separation on the drums in a way that I wouldn't expect from a regular miking setup. It's also the case that there are other songs on the record that are more conventionally presented with the entire drum kit, so that if he's 
muting some parts of what the drummer played, then that's just part of the aesthetic in the sense that, you know, when you go to make a record, we don't want to have the same sort of instrumentation for all the songs. We talk about an arc all the time. I mean, again, the paradigm, I have to go back to, you know, the Beatles for this, the ways in which, if you can imagine side two of Abbey Road, instead of being a medley to have all of those songs fleshed out, how marvelous that, I mean, as brilliant as it is, how wonderful that would be to hear Polythene Pam and Mean Mr. Mustard, and because the very orchestral, chorale-like thing there, if that was a much longer song, etc. And so that's kind of the approach that we take in sort of going, okay, wow, that was really quite different from the song that preceded it. And just as each mm -hmm. record is a reaction against the record before it, somehow when we sequence an album, you try to set things up to just go, God, the listener can't be jaded or bored in thinking like, wow, that song was... Re That's much of the problem that I have with a lot of neo-shoegaze music these days. Lots of new young bands that are under the spell of Ride and My Bloody Valentine and Slow Dive. They don't seem to be able to vary either the tempos or the instrumentation to the point where you can really distinguish. I mean, there's something beautiful about one giant oral mush of songs into the batch or whatever, but I don't know, I still like to have reactions from song to song. So what's the process? I know in any two guitar, I'm going to make a comparison to the church because you got to do that, but like, you know, where you have two electrics, it seems very intentionally sound crafted, you know, just even picking that lead sound that comes right at the beginning of the song and you know it just sounds like it's well it's chorus and reverb it's something in his we're still very much enthralled by the idea of a twin guitar attack is the uh, you know phrase that we've often employed you know and there's bands that are totally masterly at doing that that set the bar very high the church being one of them for record after record where you just kind of go how much more of this guitar interplay can they produce and make it sound like, wow, you haven't heard this particular configuration before. And it has to do, we do it by having my guitars always detuned to some strange tuning and capoed up and a step down and all of those sorts of tricks with the lead guitar player, because I'm just the rhythm guy, having a straight tuning with or without a capo. So television's another example too of just how absolutely brilliant and monumental and i've used the term enthralling it still is for me to hear two guitars answering having a conversation with each other metaphorically but is there a lot of back and forth in terms of for andy in this case what sound even he's coming up with and how that meshes with what you're doing a lot of it i think you would fix in the mix in terms of how is one going to cover the other up i mean you can eq them so that they're emphasizing different parts of the spectrum but yeah, that's often the case for the you know mixing engineer, but we try to we work very quickly and it's almost as though to find a painterly parallel there to kind of go, okay, on your palette you've got a certain amount of colors that you really like. And so we often use those with variations with each other as we're recording it and then it's up to Scott or Andy who does you know quite a bit of engineering and mixing as well to sort of choose what sounds squiggly good or distortedly good or to have a whole lot of reverb or, or chorus effects and stuff i'm not a giant effects person i've just started to do that um, i'm more of a just guy plug it in and turn it up sort of person with you know different guitars because i'm a guitar freak you know in the sense of collecting them to have to way too many guitars you don't want to know how many guitars i have mark do you have a uh, electric on the top, acoustic on the bottom, so you could actually do like so much of the change to the chorus here is that spazzy acoustic guitar that's entering. Like since you don't have sixteen note hi hat here, it's just that acoustic guitar that's you know ch completely changing the texture. Even though, as far as I can tell, not much of the background, the keyboard sound is basically the same. Everything else is basically the same. It's just adding that one element and remixing it somewhat just you know makes it transform when you get to the chorus and into the bridge there. I don't know that anybody makes a double neck acoustic and electric <laughs> guitar, but maybe that's some for some researcher boffins to get on <laughs> to get on that, you know. A fake acoustic. It would have to be yeah. Then when you actually do get to the keyboard bridge, because it actually sounds like it's the same sound that's been going on before, but it's just a completely different place in the mix, way up front in a way that it wasn't before. You know, again, would that be just 
a decision made during the mixing that like something's got to take control here? Or was that your idea in writing this that like, okay, now we're going to hand things off to the keyboard who's just playing a seething chordal, chordal kind of part. It's not like a single note line. One of the trade-offs slash payoffs of working with me for whether it's the producer or the other guys in the band is that the torturous playing just my songs because I'm the principal songwriter for all this stuff is that they do get a lot of input in the studio. It's sort of almost as though it's more interesting for me to go, okay, I've written this song, I've arranged it, let's play it, and you guys take it away from there. I almost have a minimal kind of role sometimes in the recording process. Are you a, actually a five-piece? Like, wh- who's playing the keyboard? That's me sometimes, okay. and that's Scott sometimes. Are doing that, you know, and we're both very rudimentary players. Clink out some things on piano and or some Korg thing or Casio thing or whatever. That seems to work best in a guitar band. If you get a real keyboardist in, well, you better be paying him a lot of money to slot in there. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be too busy. Probably. It would be too. Yeah, it would be too busy. It would be too flash. Yeah, Rob Campanella, who's produced a number of the records and comes in and plays on stuff these days as well. He was a keyboard player in the Brian Jonestown Massacre for years, and he's just left to just produce his own music and other people's. And he's quite proficient on piano, but he still knows not to virtuoso it up on our stuff because it really would sound out of place somehow. I like simple, straightforward, New Order-ish kinds of keyboard pads i mean we were adamantly against using any keyboards for years and only the last few records have we included them because in part we had you know a much better thing for us which was jana jacoby ex-bandmate on violin so she could make all kinds of beautiful pads and swooping melodies we didn't have any need for it or desire for it but it's only of late that we've been starting to fool around with keyboards and stuff i mean i'm steve Share, you know, ex band mate said one turn to me one time and said, You're way too enamored with New Order. I'm sorry. <laughs> and he's like, Why don't you like Joy Division much more? Like, you're always rubbishing keyboards and keyboard bands. But, you know, New Order is one of my favorite bands of all time, and there's heaps of them. But people, you know, ignore the fact that there's great, crunchy, beautiful, chimey guitars in almost all of the records, anyway. New Order always sort of got grandfathered into me because of the Joy Division connection that, that if you like the joy division guitar based sound then you can kind of follow why they would add the keyboard and how that as opposed to depeche mode or something like that which or Yaz, you know contemporary synth bands that just started as synth bands and that's what they are and it's not somehow less pure i don't know let's move back a little bit in time not all the way back to the violin days 2011 the led zeppelin 5 album which i love that album title emily are you sleeping so, yeah, we've heard a fairly restrained arrangement with the first one. This one is sort of full-on wall of sound. Do you want to say a little about what this tune is about and what, where you're at with this album before we hear it? That's a song lyrically, and I don't love to interpret the lyrics at all. You know, I'm very much a devotee of T.S. Eliot. It was, you know, always uh, often talked about the idea of the intentional fallacy of how the poet is just another interpreter of his work. If he says this poem or a songwriter says, this is about this, that, and the other, you're just another person essaying to, you know, try to make sense of what's there. So I'm not the definitive oracle about what that song means. And it's a lot of mix, uh, almost like that game, the refrigerator poetry game where a lot of words are jumbled together for poetic effect and you know i'm basically trying to say it's kind of gobbledygookish that song was sort of borne out by this effects pedal that i got and gave to steve it's called a uh, electro harmonics holier grail and it has the setting of i actually just took it into the shop that says flurb on it that gives you a kind of a theremin 13th floor elevators sort of effect and steve was the kind of guy who played acoustic guitar even though he was really into punk rock played acoustic guitar on all his life and was deeply into Nick Drake, that sort of thing. And we gave him an electric guitar and he didn't even really realize how good he was until he joined the band, he says. 
he'd always played acoustic guitar in his band, Clay Otto. So put an electric guitar in his hand and this wild pedal called a holier grail. We would just encourage him and Scott Campbell would encourage him as well to just go so far afield sonically as far as he could possibly go just to do crazy anti-leads in that particular song, you could say. And he sings, his vocals are brilliant, and everybody seemed to greatly like the way that they meshed his harmonies, meshed with mine. So we sometimes get carried away with all kinds of vocal overdubs too, and then bury them amidst, you know, a guitar maelstrom of sorts. But yeah, that was a really fun song to play live. I don't know that we do it very often anymore. If I lift the failing latch Heard every pitch from the ditch Where you flipped the inevitable catch A trite fablio and ten promises Blown like dandelion I've had it to hear you The thought of you near Just triggers trying Say goodnight without saying goodbye It's kind of this way and I have nothing to say And I don't want to lie But if you insist we'll be both of us pissed And end up unfriends So take a last look and then shut up the book As the story ends It sounds like at the beginning that he's playing above the top of the neck or below the nut or something like that. You know, somewhere you're not supposed to play on the guitar or doing a side scrape down the strings with the pick, some weird stuff like that. Steve was a great breaker of rules. He would often take a, a flip phone, mobile phone, and use that as a pick and scrape along there and sort of get all kinds of eerie intertwining overtones for things. So we thought, wow, this is a way for us at least to take a 
you know, straightforward two chord seesaw that might owe something indeed if I was being, you know, less than coy, might you know, owe something to the birds. So you want to be a rock and roll star or any bunny men song you want to, you know, shake out of the, uh, off the shelf and then to mess it up. That's always been our attitude towards covers. We've done very few cover songs. My attitude towards other people's covers is you should destroy the song, not literally of course but you know metaphorically destroy it as it were it should be recognizable just like think of what Husker Du did to Eight Miles High it's absolutely brilliant it's a completely new song for them to try to replicate sonically the way that some bands do when they do covers of things where we've been for the most part anti-covers I mean it's not even easy enough for us to learn our own songs let alone other people so yeah, you've got a couple distinct lead guitars here. So you got that weird one in the left side, but then I, I wrote Keith Richards' guitar, this... It's almost like a second rhythm part. And I think going into the chorus, I heard you know three distinct guitars over and above the main riff sloshing in to become the wall of sound, which is only less than a minute into the song. You hit the top of the dynamic range here with all the, all the harmonies here. We have kind of a policy with myself and the other guitarist. We never want to be on the same fret, let alone playing the same chord. That record, the Led Zeppelin V, kind of reflects not just the fact that we were hoping to be sued by the Zeppelin Trust, because that would have been brilliant <laughs> publicity, <laughs> but it never happened. They never took notice. You know, so Jimmy or you know Robert, if you're listening, you know, please sue us. But we just thought it was a funny expression, too. And I think we tricked quite a few people into buying the record. I got the joke that, you know, they changed the naming of the albums after four. So <laughs> it was for geeks like you, Mark, you know, who would know. <laughs> There's something insular about us, too. I mean, we're always, myself and whoever I'm working with, we're a lot of us, you know, we've done our research. I think four or five is available, too, just so you know. Okay, well, thanks. That's du- <laughs> thanks. That's duly noted. Maybe that'll be the. I'll footnote you for the next one. And but Foreigner seems, although I don't know, and I'm a fan. I like Hot Blood as much as the next dork. That they seem like they might be more litigious. Than <laughs> they might need it. I don't know. They had huge hits themselves. That back to the guitar thing. That we're never meant to be on the same chord, let alone the same fret. You know, we kind of often look at Andy and you know I don't need to but the feeling is you know get off my fret I'm on the second fret you don't you come anywhere near there and if I go up the neck he's supposed to go down so that's the secret kids you for your kids listening at home if you have two guitars don't be on the same fret don't both of you be playing the same chords that's just utterly banal you got a different rhythmic approach in this one too that at least the bass like there's an actual bass riff whereas the other two songs that we're talking about today there are pretty much eighth notes you know there's a little bit of fun on some of the turnarounds but here having an actual prominent as a bass player i think you know the bass seems to be the focus under the verses here at least that was done by a chap named scott taylor who can really play his hero is mccartney you know and he's a guitar player as well and hears wonderful melodies so scott was a very nimble bass player and would come up with really interesting lines and could play the hell out of me out of wonderful touch and sense of rhythm so yeah that's scott taylor on bass so the chorus is emily are you sleeping and then you have this big sort of explosion for a while <laughs> in pleasant dreams you'll drown the explosion is not, well, I guess after Drown, some of the time, you got a big drum riff to bring it back. Like, it sounds like the chorus is done. It's like the previous song, where you just have a really short chorus, just a couple lines, and here we have, okay, we'll have a third line, sort of after it seems like it's stopped. Yeah, it's just a weirdly structured chorus, having that big space after Emily, Are You Sleeping? And you've got four full measures of just, ta da ta da ta da ta you know, to carry you through. That doesn't sound like an obvious, you know, if you were writing on acoustic guitar or something, <laughs> like that's not a rhythm that would jump into your head. We try not to do something that would be expected. That sort of turnaround of taking it just one step farther cheekily, just like the title of the record. I think there's an association of ideas with words, too. When you think of a woman and asking a question, you know, asking if she's sleeping and then the natural but surprise in this case 
next were to come in to you know introduce the idea of sexual jealousy of asking somebody if they're mm-hmm. sleeping around and you know i've been asked before in interviews and you know, i'm like okay was this written about a specific person you were feeling jealous of? Like, no, there's no Emily. It's just another imaginary kind of thing that's meant to be more universal, the ways in which people do wonder after they break up if they're going to go through that obligatory cliche, Randy patch of vengefully using sexuality as a weapon against someone but you know that could be overthinking of it but you've mark you've obviously overthunk it (laughs) at least in terms of you know analyzing this chorus but yes you're going to take all the magic out of the song i had to look up fablio (laughs) i mean i see where you're saying about it being kind of like so you want to be a rock and roll star um almost think like beat poetry like that's ultimately where that came from this rapid fire that it lets you be as wordy as you want (laughs) in these verses in a way that it doesn't in most of your songs. I'm not a fan of beat poetry in the slightest. I'm much more a traditional sort of person, but I am a fan of that sort of scat approach that Dylan takes, even though we don't, we're not going to get into this, the whole thing of Dylan winning the Nobel for literature, because I'll just upset people because I love Dylan as much as the next guy who hates harmonica unless it's in the mouth of Neil Young or whatever. Listen to all the name droppings here. But um, yeah, I don't know. It seemed like appropriate for the the song to just kind of reel off a whole lot of juxtaposed. I'm a much bigger fan of actual nonsense, self-conscious nonsense, like you know Lewis Carroll or Edward Lear, than I would be of the Kerouacs and the Ginsbergs at all. What makes it appealing is that it's over a riff that is entertaining enough that you can repeat it apparently lots of times at the end of the song, that it's like way over a minute of a fade out <laughs> of this the same riff with some, there's a little guitar interesting stuff going on here and there. And, and the fact that you come in with this nice arpeggio thing, like way at the end, right as it's fading out, <laughs> pretty awesome. Thank you very much. We're often, t- you know, we often take chances with the listener and try to reward the listener as well. But the, nobody but myself and the people who've been in the band loves a two chord seesaw drone as much as we do. Still, my goal to try to write a song with just one chord. I think one of the greatest songs ever written has barely two, which for me is, you know, Jimi Hendrix's Are You Experienced? And that's just one hammered. I think it's an E chord with some odd overtones there. And he rarely changes to another chord. The boffins and the geeks who learn other people's songs will get me. But um, I really like the minimal sort of droning approaches to things. You have to find a way, uh, obviously, to, to make it more interesting. And we often do that by introducing some squiggly wonky crazy guitar and it's driving enough i like i often bring up since you bring up harmonica so like the rolling stone song going home which just is this blues thing it just goes on it, it is over 10 minutes long and it's kind of this groove that just keeps 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 going what record is that on oh, can't yeah. imagine that that's the stones released a song that's 10 minutes long 1965 so what album is that aftermath yes it's the last song in aftermath and it's 10 minutes long. I just played after that the other day. I just didn't notice. I could be making wow. that up. No, it's 11 minutes. That's what I see on, on Wikipedia. <laughs> no kidding. There's a nice tidbit of trivia for you. You're doing a very small version of, of that here, but it's the fact that it's so driving in the first place. It's not like a laid back blues thing that takes a long enough to go through it once. This is a fast song. So if you're going to fill over a minute of the same riff, then... <laughs> That's a lot of times that the riff is playing. The fact that it's so driving, the reason that So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star, it doesn't sound like the previous Birds album. It's a comment on, and I think a stylistic imitation of the Monkees. Like it was a specific reaction to these manufactured bands. So I sort of think of that style, that fast style, as actually connotes Monkees to me, which in turn connotes a video of people like running around in fast... (laughs) like sped up to this part in my imagination it seems very active let me say that even though it's repetitive there's also the element of somebody like drop another name and another influence and great love of mine somebody like spaceman three if they're just pedaling on one chord for a while there's an element of suspense of in the listener going okay 
how much longer are they going <laughs> to do this? You know, and can I anticipate the change on this ne- in this next bar? Or okay, oh, it didn't happen there. Um, maybe the next one or whatever. Just you know, I'm a big fan of trying to create a certain sort of muted drama in the songs, not anything bombastic or you know over the top, but just again headphone subtly things that are made just for listeners like you, Mark, who are, notice things. That's a great compliment to think, wow, we put things in there for people to notice, to notice, and they were noticed. Brilliant. All right, well, let's go back another six years here to the Hypnotizing Sea 2005. The song is Inner City Garden. You know, we had the weird guitar sound on the last song. We have another weird guitar sound on this one, but it actually, like, is weird in rhythm. Like, it is the core of the song. It's not just, like, a little weird that you put over the top like it is the thing that starts us off do you want to kind of introduce where you're at with this in this song before we hear it the sort of fire siren the, almost like in you know the way english sirens sound when you go to london it's a different horn that's blaring to warn you not to step off the sidewalk that's not something i could take credit for that's uh, was gary sullivan the drummer for both the hypnotizing sea and a record called tattered Amalian and another one called very mary beth gary's an insanely talented guitar player i often have people in my band i mean my goal has always been to be the worst musician in my band and i all, i haven't always achieved that but it's my thinking that the front person who's just meant to play rhythm guitar i mean he should be the weakest link but not a weak link but gary plays a really mean guitar as well as being a monster drummer he's moved back to dublin now so he's not around but i was just thinking about that song because you said you'd like to play it and we could discuss it but yeah Gary played that fire alarm sort of guitar too over the chords. It's just one riff that's hammered on over the chord changes. And again, that's the kind of the magic of the twin guitar attack that you can find certain keys to write in that one chord. I guess I have achieved a sort of one chord song if you want to consider that chord the chord because there's a number of changes, you know, in that from G to F sharp to C to E minor or whatever, the obligatory thing that I do sometimes. And then I think it really worked brilliantly for him just to hammer on something that was very complimentary and super melodic and dissonant at the same time. And it kind of encapsulates what the Black Watch is kind of all about anyway, where we try to make this sweetness amidst the miasma or the crunchiness. So that's what we are, Mark. Sweet, crunchy.
in my inner city garden, I can feel the city quieten. This is not a quiet song. Well, there you have it once again, Mark. You know, you've pegged it. You know, what, what do you need me for? You can just interpret these things on your own. You've been right every time. It almost seems like it's the chorus part, the to see. You know, you, it's still driving. Very thick harmonies on this. A whole Beach Boys thing going on. You don't actually realize that on this chorus until everything drops out at the end. At least there's some amount of peace in this to see part, as opposed to the verses, which really are, you're still out in the city. You're not in the nice garden yet. Again, you, there you have us. Very nice <laughs> explanation of what we do to juxtapose something that's contrary. You know, it's a very oxymoronic kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, approach to music. Let's have this song about a very placid, sacrosanct haven, but have it be screeching with super detuned, blaring guitars. So that's on the, on the screechier end of, you know, again, vocally too. So. You put it better than I did. <laughs> well, so is that the kind of thing that just evolves as you're working at the arrangement? So maybe when you wrote it, you were actually thinking you wrote it on acoustic and it was a nice, quiet song? <laughs> no, it was it was written on acoustic, as I often do. I do a lot of writing on acoustic, but driving acoustic. You know, I think we're much less self-conscious. I mean, it's just a sort of, you know, our aesthetic. That's the signature thing. You could probably go through if you wanted to each record and there'd be two or three songs there that really melded a very sweet and sour you know approach to songwriting and to song the producing of songs too that's just kind of in effect what we do and fall back on and now you've gotten me to be sort of self-conscious thinking you know if there is another record i we shouldn't do that anymore because we've done that so many times but inner city garden is certainly you know exemplary this is really kind of what this band is about This definitely stood out to me as one of the more effective walls of sound here. You know, just a really great mix of things. When you're writing it, these little REM melodies, like at the beginning, so you have, it's really two different guitars that come in successively. One is, it almost could be a a piano melody. And then this do, 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 do. Like, is that part of the song as you initially write it? Or is that part of the arrangement? In other words, whoever's playing lead for you would throw that on. I did the lead on that. And that's because I've been playing guitar since I was... In fourth grade, and my tagline always is, I still play like a fourth grader. I I can hold my own with anybody as a rhythm guitar player. I have a very steady, fluttery right hand, but I'm not a lead player at all. But I think sometimes it's really interesting to have a non-lead player play the lead in a rhythmic-ish kind of sort of way. You know, again, to get away from that semblance of virtuosity, which we're not crazy about. Anyway, something that smacks of, you know, the virtuoso is something that we'd sort of reject. I would think I was just doing the best that I could do. I do feel as though I'm not talking with too much hubris when I say, yes, I really believe that I have a very strong sense of melody. It's my strong suit, that's for sure. So in terms of guitar playing, that carries over from the songs into the either acoustic or electric playing. Well, I mean, that's why people play the driver eight part by <laughs> REM. It's because you don't have to be a good guitarist, but it's like it's such a good little melody that it's the hybridization of a lead and a rhythm part. Uh, you mentioned the cure that I hear that all, all over the place. That even when he's, when Robert Smith is having somebody else do the lead guitar line, they still seem to be trying to play like Robert Smith, you know, those just slidey single note kind of things. Like it's only there to give a counter melody, it's not there to be a lead instrument, really. Yes, I think that comes, you know, because um, those of us who came out of the post-punk era have a kind of an horror of show-off-y kinds of approaches to things. Anything that's really super wankerish guitar playing or keyboard thing that you alluded to before of somebody playing too busily is something that we abominate. So that comes from that. And, you know, certainly early REM, I talk with Rob Campanella about this all the time, who's a big fan of all the way up through, I think, Fables of the Reconstruction or the document record. Peter Buck freed up a lot of us guitar players who just could play rhythm, you know, quite well and air sets kinds of leads to just go, hey, it's okay to just jingle jangle down the lane. And if you keep the tempos up, nobody notices the flubs live <laughs> anyway. So there you go. So I've never actually heard anybody else use the expression you just used that I used all the time, which I want to be the worst player in my band. 
that I don't always achieve that, you know. <laughs> but um, sometimes there's people in the band who are just like, I love them as a person and they're good enough, but they're very reliable and they're my mate. So, you know, they're in, but you know, I won't comment about whether that's the case right now. I guess also like The Cure, you know, when they have a fully functioning lead guitarist, like it's obvious in this song or the previous song that your lead guitarist is really good. You know, that siren thing, that's not a thing that like a regular, you know, strumma strumma guy like us can do as a band that is constantly having to make a first impression. In other words, like (laughs) is not well known. It's such an advantage to have a lead guitarist who, even if they're very tasteful about it, is obviously a really, really good musician because then, you know, it might take people a couple listens to get into your songs. It'll just kind of wash over them the first time to actually remember melodies might take a listen or two, but people can spot like a tight player doing flashy things. Like there's no <laughs> preparation needed to appreciate that. So I've, I've always felt like to cover my bases, it would be nice <laughs> to get at least a lead player that can, you know, sort of is objectively good because you're not, and I'm projecting onto you, but like, you know, we're not, we're not with our voices showing off in an American Idol sort of way. And <laughs> there's nothing that's leaping out about, you know, have just having a tight rhythm section. So having at least that one element that can lure people in is valuable. And I saw that in both these last two songs. That's again, very, you know, well done, good job. Well, and you'd mentioned in your book, I think Sonic Youth is a formative influence here, which I definitely heard that in this song more, more so than other things. Of course, Sonic Youth, like they yeah. won't even play a major chord. <laughs> I believe. No. Isn't that a rule? Like, no major chords in the whole thing. No, we don't have that. No, we don't have that rule. Because, I mean, uh, older, earlier bass player Roger Butchers, who played on the terrific song, the big hit that we had, big ish hit that we had in 1991, he turned to me one time in the course of recording, flowering, or rehearsal, or amphetamines, the other record that came after that, and said, John, you know, you know, all of these fancy tunings and capos and approaches that you have, it's all just. G, C, D, occasional E minor. <laughs> so it's quite possible. I love Sonic Youth. I think that they're worth scrutinizing. I think there's only one or two records of theirs that I think that they've misstepped. NYC Ghosts and Ghosts and Stories, or that one. That one's the poetry. Again, beat poetry one. I think it's rubbish. But the rest of the records are just fantastic. And anybody who's a fan of the guitar and of experimental songwriting within the construct of pop music is going to like them unless they can't stand Kim Gordon's voice or something. So, you know, taking any of these influences that you've mentioned, and then it's up to us as self-aware enough artists to just kind of go, okay, how can we mask these sorts of things? I've been under the shadow of a number of things like, you know, a number of bands like the Beatles or the Cure or New Order for such a long time that I'm not a very super meticulous person, but I do try to very self-consciously hide those influences somehow. And I don't know whether I succeed, but yeah, that's part of the goal. Everybody has influences, but I think it's really important to try to surmount them as much as you possibly can. As long as you're not doing Robert Smith's voice, then I, I don't think there's any danger. Of- <laughs> well, early on, I was definitely, I wasn't as proficient at masking that influence because, you know, I really love The Cure. Unabashedly, I can say that now. If you haven't twigged that already, listeners, I really love that band. I always have. I always will. But yeah, early on, it was very difficult for me to disguise that influence. So, it, you know, took a lot of practice. I'm a vocalist, not a singer. I'm, I haven't been trained at all. I mean, I just, I'm not a slave to my own voice. There's a certain style there. It's probably one of the reasons why we don't do, we've only done two or three covers in the course of the band, too, because gosh, I don't want to embarrass myself. <laughs> if you sing your own songs, it can sound like that's how it's meant to be, Mark. <laughs> all right, our final thing we're going to introduce a brand new song, Much of a Muchness. Much of a Muchness is part of a 7-inch EP coming as a B-side to a 7-inch that we're doing with this lovely guy, Stu Pope, his label, Hypnotic Bridge, that he runs out of Sierra Madre, California. He's very deep in the psychedelic 60s, very specifically, I think, you know, Stu says, oh, I really love 67 and 68, you know, so as far as boffins go, he's really specific, but he, I didn't even know he had a label when I sent him some songs i thought he might just know somebody who might want to release this next record called brilliant failures that we're really excited about you know we're very excited about magic johnson but brilliant failures as well 
and he goes, wow, I, you know, I love vinyl. I, I do, I do exclusive seven inches. I won't put a barcode on my releases. If you're cool with that, I'd love to put this out. So I thought, okay, well, I think it's a song that we just recorded just for the seven inch. There's three songs on there, but I thought, okay, I don't want to take a song off Brilliant Failures, too many songs off of it, but let's record one that Stu can keep and have as an exclusive kind of thing. So out came this one, Much of a Muchness. All right. Well, thanks so much. I will point folks at your your website. It's just johnandrewfrederick.com, right? There's no separate Black Watch site other than just, you know, you can look them up on Bandcamp and get some of the stuff. Yeah, facebook.com, the Black Watch Music. Gotcha. All right. Well, thanks so much for doing this. Really, really enjoyed immersing myself in your world. Oh, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Absolutely nice to meet you. All right. Here's much of a muchness. Thanks so much to John. I would say the Black Watch deserves to be a much better known band. I'm very glad to have discovered them and have still been listening to his songs subsequent to this interview. I'm super excited for the next episode. Homer Flynn from the band The Residents. Wonderful, experimental, psychedelic, crazy sounding band that goes all the way back to the late 60s. I have two after that already recorded. One with Dave Schramm, who is the first lead guitarist for Yola Tango, has long fronted his own band, The Shrams. Great guitar style. And finally, I 
Just talked to John Kolpitz, a.k.a. Kid Millions. He's one of the leaders of the band Oneida and has his own project called Man Forever. He's just an amazing drummer. Are there folks you would like me to interview for this podcast? Please email me at mark at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. Even if you've already emailed me before, do it again. I've probably forgotten your recommendation, and I welcome your assistance in helping me broaden my horizons. I must inform you again about my new entertainment podcast, Pretty Much Pop. We've had more awesome interviews on that. Just released one with Lucy Lawless. And if you do not already support this podcast, we could really use that at patreon.com slash nakedly examined music. Thank you so much for lending your ears to this podcast production. Nakedly Examined Music is a member of the Partially Examined Life podcast network. Check it out at partiallyexaminedlife.com. Keep on musicin'. Until next time, this is Mark Linton Meyer signing off.